thank you for being here because this is for me a learning exercise and you may uh, perhaps help along and, uh, and give me some uh, uh, clues on, on how to proceed and develop my interest for this topic. Uh, the other question is uh, why a, uh, a seminar on, uh, on, on cancer uh, in, a, in a genetic center? Well, this is easy to answer because, uh, as we all know, it's working. Uh, cancer is a genetic disorder, and uh, uh, there is every evidence for it. But, and these two are just two pioneers in the field. Uh, Boveri, uh, Theodore Boveri in 1914 uh, published this uh, long article or short book, if you wish, uh, uh, in German, about the uh, translated title concerning the origin of malignant tumors. And basically, with the instrument he had available at that time, uh, he showed uh, that the chromosomes uh, change significantly once a, uh, a normal cell uh, becomes a uh, cancer cell. While in, uh, uh, later, in 1971, more recently, uh, Alec Knudsen uh, focused the attention on individual genes rather than on chromosome and proposed the, what was then called the two-hit hypothesis, which is no longer an hypothesis, it's a reality. And uh, Alfred developed that uh, model uh, with a, uh, a retinoblastoma, which is a, a childhood tumor that can uh, clinically uh, uh, present in uh, two ways. One, early and multifocal. Early meaning uh, at birth or soon after birth. And the two, uh, of late onset and monofocal. And late onset means by the age of three or four years. Uh, the difference being, according to this hypothesis, uh, that in the, uh, in the case of the, uh, of the early tumors, of the inherited tumors, uh, the, the, the babies are born with a uh, mutation already present in the uh, constitutional genome, which predisposes to the development of the tumor. Uh, and the tumor will develop when a second mutation will occur on the same gene. And since you have the first mutation already in place, it's quite, uh, uh, it's almost inevitable uh, that the second mutation will occur and will cause the uh, development of cancer. In the second case, uh, you need the two somatic mutations, so it's much less likely and it takes more time. Uh, the result is the same, the tumor is the same, but the uh, cause is, is different. Now, this seems to be very obvious, uh, but I, I, I had the fortune to uh, uh, first uh, uh, know uh, Al Knudsen around that time, when he was writing up his, uh, uh, his hypothesis. And I, I got to understand it because he explained it to me not because I read it on the papers. And uh, I have to admit that it took several sessions of <laughs> explaining before I could fully grasp the uh, significance of, of, this, uh, of this hypothesis. The, um, uh, the, the, the role of genes, the study of genes in cancer received a uh, tremendous push forward by this uh, I would call it a manifesto uh, published by Renato Gulbecco in 1986. Uh, basically, what he said was um, to understand cancer, we need to understand the cancer genes. And to understand the cancer genes, we have to have a knowledge of all of the genes uh, in our genome. And five years later, the uh, Human uh, Genome Project was underway, uh, and that was, of course, a, a total uh, change of uh, scenario and allowed uh, for uh, uh, some you know, uh, basic uh, developments of the, regarding the, the role of, of uh, uh, genes in cancer, like one proposed by uh, Beth Fogelstein in the 
in the 1990s. Uh, uh, this is now a classic uh, uh, model, which is uh, proceeding from normal to cancer. Is for in, in the uh, colon cancer is called the Fogelgram, uh, and uh, in, uh, starting uh, from a normal uh, epithelial cell in the uh, in the intestine. Uh, uh, thanks to the mutation in, in, in one gene, there will be a, a transition from a normal epithelium to an adenoma, which is a proliferating uh, small mass in the intestine. And uh, uh, this is a, uh, a mutation that uh, fortunately occurs not so rarely, but not so frequently in the general population so that uh, colon cancer is one of the most frequent cancers, but not like everybody has it. Uh, uh, on the other hand, if APC, a, a mutation of APC is inherited, uh, then the uh, situation is totally different because that person who inherited the mutation will have a predisposition. So this first step is already there, and uh, it's from, from there on, it's much easier to proceed uh, to uh, somatic mutation, first of KRAS, that will induce a late adenoma, then BAT26, which will induce a uh, early cancer, and then B53 for a full cancer. And here is the um, uh, a simplification of the uh, histologic changes that will occur with the accumulation of uh, different mutations. The uh, uh, Fogelstein uh, uh, further elaborated on this model uh, by, thanks to the knowledge of more genes, uh, uh, you know, bringing into the picture uh, other genes like BRAF, uh, KRAS, uh, APC, P53 again. Uh, that are the ones that will induce a, a first step uh, moving a normal cell into a more proliferating state and therefore facilitating the accumulation of other mutations like in TERT, in CDK2 and A, like in PIK3CA, uh, KRAS, which uh, uh, induce a, an expansion phase of this original predisposed cell, and from here on, uh, further mutations will induce uh, the uh, full cancer and metastasis. Uh, but again, a limited number of genes and, and, and a limited number of steps. Um, uh, uh, all of this. Uh, knowledge has been facilitated by the study of hereditary cancer that uh, uh, represented and continue to represent an interesting model system, even though individually rare. Retinoblastoma, leaflet from any syndrome, which is a multiple cancer syndrome, Cowden syndrome that we have discussed uh, last week in the, uh, during the conclave, familial adenomatosis polyposis coli, uh, with the APC gene, uh, uh, Lynch syndrome uh, due to uh, uh, mutation of mismatch repair genes, breast ovarian cancer with uh, BRCA1 and BRCA2. Uh, the, uh, uh, all of these mutations are, are, are essentially uh, uh, dominant mutations that will induce proliferation that facilitate uh, further uh, progression into cancer. Uh, with, the, uh, with the only exception of uh, the RB1 gene, which behaves differently, if you have only one RB1 mutation, cancer will not occur. For cancer to occur, it is necessary that the second mutation will occur in the same gene, uh, uh, so uh, causing the uh, initiation of the progression of the tumor. So if uh, uh, these uh, Hereditary cancers have brought uh, important knowledge into the field. Uh, maybe it is worthwhile studying 
other possible uh, uh, genes predisposing to cancer, like has been done uh, much more recently now, this is uh, December 2015, by uh, this group, I believe it is around the um, St. Jude's uh, Children's Hospital in Memphis, who uh, studied a, a cohort of uh, uh, 11, uh, 120 patients by whole exome or whole genome sequencing, and uh, uh, they interrogated uh, 565 genes that could have something to do with cancer or with cell proliferation, cell cycle, and uh, they found uh, probably pathogenic mutations in 8.5% of their cohort consisting of children with leukemia, CNS tumor, neuroblastoma, and other tumors. And uh, here is just a, uh, a, a detail on uh, the uh, uh, genes they were, they, they found more frequently uh, uh, mutated. There were 60 genes in this class of autosomal dominant cancer predisposing genes, and multiple mutations were found in APC, BRCA2, NF1, PM52, RB1, RANX1, TP53. A, uh, another few mutations from uh, six to, to, to uh, uh, fill out from 60 to 95 were uh, sparse among these other classes. And when they uh, looked into the, uh, the uh, how these uh, genes distributed into the into the uh, uh, various cancers, they they found, for instance, the TP53 uh, was more prevalent in adrenal cortical tumor, but also in leukemia and in other, and in other cancers. Uh, and um, some uh, findings were, were rather predictable, other less, for instance, that PRACA2 uh, could, uh, uh, could be found in, in, uh, in leukemia and in uh, CNS tumor. Uh, so there was there was some findings that were predictable, others that were not. And uh, uh, when they uh, looked at the mutation frequency in 21 genes, and mostly frequently mutated according to cancer subtypes, they found the following: for instance, uh, uh, the adrenal cortical tumors were the one that were uh, uh, more likely to be uh, found. Uh, uh, with the presence of, of these of these of mutation in these genes, uh, osteosarcoma, retinoblastoma, and and others as well. Uh, the uh, there was one uh, one unexpected finding though when they when they write their conclusion uh, in addition to to what I just briefly mentioned, they also say this, which was unexpected. Family history did not predict the presence of an underlying predisposition syndrome in most patients. So basically, uh, uh, even though the, these mutations say found constitutionally because we we're, I forgot to say that, but all of these mutations were germinal, and yeah, they, they were found in blood, not, not in the tumors. So even though they were predicted to be predisposing mutations, yet the uh, presence in families that could be predicted was not found. Uh, so even, even if these may be considered predisposing genes, certainly the kind of predisposition they give is not as strong as in the classical uh, conditions we described before, like retinoblastoma, uh, adenomatosis, coli, etc. Now, um, here comes the difficult part when we have to deal with the mo most common tumors, those that depend on uh, somatic uh, mutations. All coding genes uh, have been sequenced in uh, no less than 22,000 different cancers. Three million somatic mutations have been described. Every tumor harbors thousands of genetic and epigenetic alterations. Uh, so there is a mass 
of uh, an incredible amount of uh, uh, variance that we have to deal with. And uh, the uh, picture becomes extremely complicated, even if it has been possible with uh, uh, functional studies and with uh, studying the frequency of these mutations to figure out that only 200 genes uh, act, in fact, as cancer genes, at least as drivers that initiate the uh, cancer progression or are significantly important during the cancer progression. So this limits uh, the, the, the field to some extent, but the field continues to be extremely complicated. Now, I, uh, I, I chose to uh, uh, say something concerning uh, these uh, uh, somatic cancer genes using a glioblastoma multiforme uh, as a model, as a model system. Uh, it's, it's a brain tumor. It's the, one of the most lethal human cancers. There is no cure for it. Survival is measured in months, a few years. And uh, uh, the um, adjective multiforme in reality is no longer, in reality is no longer used, but it, it means variable uh, uh, manifestation, variable phenotype, even macroscopic phenotype of the tumor, which has different uh, uh, colors, different uh, uh, ways of presenting itself and the diffusion into the brain. Uh, there is a histologic classification, which is revised every uh, so many years, for uh, um, uh, gliomas, uh, uh, except for the localized glioma, which is grade one, which is essentially a benign tumor. The classification deals with uh, uh, grade two to five uh, gliomas uh, from the uh, astrocytoma, which is the, the, the more benign, but relatively benign because you see the median survival in years is between six and eight. Uh, uh, the oligodendroglioma, which is uh, similarly a grade two glioma, which occurs in the white matter and cortex of the cerebral hemisphere with low mitotic activity and non-necrosis. The oligoastrocytoma again grade two, and then uh, on to the anaplastic astrocytoma oligodendroglioma, which is a grade three, highly infiltrating with a median survival years of three years, and finally grade four glioblastoma, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the the worst one, the uh, most lethal one, infiltrating glial neoplasm with necrosis and microvascular proliferation, high rate of mitosis one to two years survival, median survival. The uh, uh, knowledge of the, the, of the genes, the sequencing on all of the tumors that have been performed over uh, recent years uh, led to uh, a, a genetic and epigenetic landscape to be delineated of grade two, two and three gliomas. Uh, Isocitrate Androgenase one mutations uh, affecting arginine 132 are present in 80% of the cases. So a very common uh, mutation, especially in grade two and three uh, glioma. Uh, to some extent in, in, in glioblastoma as well. Now glioblastoma is is can pro can be a uh, can can progress from. Uh, grade 3 uh, astrocytoma. But in most cases, its presentation is from the very beginning as grade 4 glioblastoma. And in this case, the uh, IDH1 mutation is less common. There are TP53 and the NTRX mutations, chromosome 17p loss of heterozygosity, chromosome 1p and 19q deletions, increased global DNA methylation. Uh, these are the uh, so-called uh, genetic and epigenetic landscape of grade two and three gliomas. And possibly another uh, classification is, uh, can be made 
uh, in, uh, and this is for the glioblastoma, uh, GBM is the abbreviation from, from glioblastoma multiforme, uh, where a, uh, a, a pro-neural pro -neural subclass has been identified where PDG, FRA, CDK6, CDK4, MET are uh, upregulated and EDH1 mutations are present, even though uh, not in, in all cases. Then there is a so-called classical uh, subclass, the uh, EGFR uh, upregulated uh, up, uh, up uh, CDKN2A and P10 downregulated. And the Zenkimal subclass with NF1 downregulated uh, and uh, TP353 and uh, CDKN2A as well. Neural is the sort of default class with no unique signature has been found. Uh, another important thing which, is, which has practical implication is to um, uh, the, uh, uh, understand that, that there are uh, altered pathways, uh, a signal, a signaling pathway in glioblastoma. A, a, uh, there is an altered RTK, which is receptor target uh, kinase, RAS PI3K signaling uh, in 88% of neuroblastomas, an alteration of the P3 signaling in 87%, an alteration of RB signaling in 78 uh, it, it is important to, uh, uh, to have a view uh, of this because these are potentially actionable uh, uh, targets for uh, therapy. Now, the picture becomes uh, even more complicated. Um, and uh, if you uh, are interested in learning more about what I'm going to say, now and even something I saw before, I there are four papers that I I put down here that you have to read yourself uh, <laughs> if you want to know better what I'm talking about. Uh, uh, this one is is a um, is a expression study. Uh, by uh, genomic um, RNA seq of 82 uh, gliomas of grade 2 to 4. Uh, so it's a genomic landscape of 82 gliomas of grade 2 to 4. And um, uh, the. Um, no, I. Try to remember whether. No, this is this is not an expression. This is a mutation a mutation study of sorry of 82 gliomas, and the um, uh, a number of uh, mutant genes have been interrogated, uh, and that may have importance and may be relevant to cancer, and uh, were grouped depending on the uh, signaling pathway they belong to, and. Uh, um, uh, each one of these small tiles is one individual glioma, so there should be 82 of these. And uh, for instance, all of them contain the uh, IDH1 mutation. Uh, most of them contain the TP53 mutation. And uh, here you have how many of these are of grade 2 or grade, of grade 2 or grade 3 or grade 4. And uh, the colors are the uh, different uh, uh, kind of mutations you have uh, in, in, in the various genes that were interrogated. And they, it's impossible to, to, to go in detail in, in this uh, picture, but the idea is to, uh, for you to grasp the uh, great variability. We are talking about uh, gliomas, so your definite cancer type, and yet the, uh, the mutability 
is, is extreme and in genes and also in, uh, in uh, uh, presence of uh, copy number alterations with uh, uh, losses or gains of uh, uh, many uh, containing a different type of genes. Just to uh, give you the impression of the uh, enormous variability uh, that uh, we are dealing with, I, I don't know whether you saw the, the, uh, the, the, the uh, notice from the seminar that circulated a while ago, which had the original title that I had given to this lecture, which included the strange word, the chameleonic uh, nature of, of cancer. I don't even know how to pronounce the word, but the idea was to, uh, uh, to indicate that the, the, there is extreme variability, not only extreme variability, but changing uh, of the landscape with progression. The same uh, tumors, the same 882, or some of the, uh, the gliomas that were followed up uh, uh, a number of years later, uh, the original, uh, uh, the original um, analysis essentially changed their face. The same mutations were no longer present, new mutations appeared. So if, uh, even if uh, you had found a, uh, uh, an effective treatment uh, in the first instance, when you uh, when the primary tumor was treated, clearly the tumor had in some way to get around it and uh, to let families of cells that were resistant uh, to, the, uh, to this treatment to uh, develop even further and to uh, eventually uh, uh, continue the progression of the tumor. Now, uh, to make things even more complicated, uh, uh, this group of uh, Patel et al, uh, they did trans transcriptome analysis. This was an expression study of approximately 6,000 genes in 430 individual cells from uh, uh, five ADH12 uh, glioblastomas. So they took five tumors, they isolated uh, individual cells from this tumor and they interrogated uh, each cell on about uh, around the expression of 6,000 genes. And they were able to, um, to uh, uh, this is the protocol they used. Uh, uh, this is the, uh, the, the clustering of uh, CND profiles inferred from all single cells uh, by RNA-seq data. And uh, there is a clustering uh, of uh, uh, CNAs uh, depending on the, the, the tumor they are from. Uh, these are the ones from the green tumor. Uh, these are the ones from the pink tumor, and so on. And uh, uh, all of these uh, uh, 430 uh, cells uh, were, when individually interrogated, uh, showed again uh, a great de degree of variability. Some uh, mutations, uh, some variants were recurrent. For instance, the um, uh, chromosome 10 uh, was, was lost, essentially, in, in, in all cases like chromosome 7 was gained in all cases. But for instance, the uh, chromosome uh, uh, 13 uh, here was uh, at uh, losses only in a subset of uh, tumors. Uh, chromosome 15, again, the same. Uh, the, there was a gain of uh, chromosome 5 in, in this subgroup. Uh, otherwise, it was a very, very wide scatter of all different uh, kinds of uh, uh, variants in, in all of the cells. And uh, uh, even though there was a tendency of the 
various tumors to, to, to group as more equal to each other than uh, to the other groups. But there were some outliers, you know, like this cell here which should belong to this uh, uh, group, to this tumor has a, has a pattern of expression which is more into this other group, or this one, or the gray ones, and so on. And uh, the same type of uh, scatter of uh, uh, variability is uh, found when some, um, when the expression of uh, some individual genes was was measured. And uh, once again, uh, to uh, to uh, emphasize the the variability, this is clearly. The reason, one of the reasons why it is so difficult to, to treat these two works. So, is it just a mission impossible, or is there anything at all that we can uh, try and do to uh, find a way into, uh, into this uh, uh, chemiotic uh, variability? So, Giovanni, in the figure D, what are those population control points? Do you these are these are the normals. That we are, we are um, out of a, the 430 cells uh, that they examined, uh, 10 had a normal pattern. So, compared to a, to, to a control brain. So, those were not tumor cells, evidently, that were embedded into the cancer cells. And uh, I believe these uh, are, are controls. Uh, the, uh, and, and the ones with the, with the color inside are belong to the tumors but behave like the control cells. And this is a, a, a I would say a nice further evidence of uh, how uh, the accurate the method they have used is to tell a cancer cell from a normal cell. Um, well, this is again more of the same. I, I, I wanted to proceed uh, further to uh, come to the uh, uh, treatment issue. So let's take a, a step backward and uh, See where we're coming from and where we're trying to go. We basically come from evidence-based medicine, which is an approach to medical practice intended to optimize decision-making by emphasizing the use of evidence from well-designed and conducted research. For instance, in the case, I just chose this example, in the case of uh, breast cancer, uh, evidence-based medicine uh, uh, told us that cyclophosphamide is an effective treatment. Uh, except that it works only on a given population of individuals that are free to the cyclophosphamide. So the other one will say, what do we care about cyclophosphamide if it doesn't do any good for us? Uh, uh, some uh, advancement was, uh, was, was done with the use, subsequently with the use of this uh, uh, antibody trastuzumab for cases overexpressing of her, overexpressing her, uh, uh, one of the the three positives that we were discussing yesterday or the other day, uh, and uh, but this is already an advancement into the um, a personalized medicine, a medical model that separates patients into different groups with medical decision practices, interventions, and or products being tailored to the individual patient based on their predicted response of risk disease or risk disease. So for those uh, uh, women who have uh, a uh, uh, HER expressed on the surface of cancer cells, we can make the uh, treatment a little bit more personalized, not only cyclophosphamide, but also trastuzumab. and the translational medicine that we heard about this morning. 
this is a rapidly growing science whose aim is to expedite the discovery of new diagnostic tools and treatments by using a multidisciplinary bench to bedside approach. And um, I must say that some of the um, results in this field uh, recently have been uh, stunning and really uh, very important from a practical viewpoint. They, uh, they uh, probably the most classical and best known example is that of imatinib, uh, uh, which uh, uh, inhibits uh, BCL, uh, ABL tyrosine kinase, the constitutive abnormal gene product of the Philadelphia chromosome in chronic myeloid leukemia, by, uh, by occupying a, uh, a, uh, a receptor in, in this uh, chimeric protein, uh, uh, Imatinib mesylate uh, blocks the activity of this uh, BCA uh, ABL uh, kinase and uh, proves to be uh, very effective in, in positive Philadelphia positive chronic myeloid leukemia, uh, in Philadelphia positive uh, uh, ALL, and in GIST, which is an investigative tumor. Uh, Again, uh, not for uh, all patients, but uh, uh, really the, uh, the discovery has, has changed dramatically the scenario of CML, which is you know, a fatal disorder, into one that at least in a large proportion of patients now is treatable. Or the, uh, uh, this inhibitor of femurafenib, which inhibits the uh, uh, B600E mutation in uh, the RAF kinase, which is uh, highly prevalent in, uh, in melanoma. Uh, so if a melanoma patient is found to have uh, this particular mutation, uh, the treatment with remorafenib is, is highly effective. Uh, so clearly, uh, this is, a, uh, is an excellent example of uh, um, precision uh, treatment, I would say, uh, and, uh, and also personalized treatment because it is, it is adaptable only uh, for uh, those uh, individuals who have this kind of mutation in their melanoma. Uh, and of course, this model can be expanded to uh, all of the uh, pathways that, uh, we, that we know uh, that they are actionable by uh, you know, a number of, uh, of drugs that are known to inhibit one or the other of the steps of this, of this pathways. And this is a, a, a well-known uh, model depicting the, the RAS and PI3K uh, pathways all leading, uh, whose uh, increased expression all lead to, uh, to the cancer. So, uh, what translational medicine and uh, uh, about translational medicine and, and glioblastoma multiforme? What to expect uh, in consideration? Uh, one that, uh, uh, for instance, the, uh, this particular um, uh, receptor AGFR is is uh, is uh, frequently involved in, in glioblastoma multiforme. So. On one hand, we have hope that this, you know, offer hope that there is something that can be done. On the other hand, there is the high variability of the tumor, which which is the the, the other side of the coin. Um, for instance, the, uh, the, the we had to uh, to accept the the failure of. Uh, uh, drugs that were like uh, gefitinib and erlotinib that were uh, thought to, um, uh, to, to, go, to, to be the good inhibitors of uh, AGFR tyrosine kinases uh, uh, for a number of reasons, <laughs> for instance, for pharma pharmacokinetic failure because uh, the uh, <coughs> dosage of the drug was uh, never enough uh, to, uh, uh, to fully inhibit the, uh, these tyrosine uh, kinases, especially this variant, AGF 
R variant 8, which is present in place of the regular AGFR, essentially in, in all of the glioblastomas who have been studied, or because uh, the, uh, the, the, the drugs are ineffective because in addition uh, to a, a, the mutation uh, causing the appearance of AGFR3, uh, there is also a PTAN mutation. Uh, so this will uh, uh, definitely uh, cause an acceleration of this pathway, even if AGF uh, uh, V3 is partially, partially inhibited by these drugs. Uh, mTOR uh, was another potential target. Why? Rapamycin doesn't have any action at all on uh, on 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 glioblastoma. Uh, well, there may be uh, a number of reasons again, uh, because the uh, uh, rapamycin is is unable to fully uh, inhibit uh, M M torque one. Uh, mtop one is here uh, and uh, is uh, central to a uh, to a number of uh, sub pathway, uh, including uh, uh, including autophagy, and also including a feedback uh, reaction onto uh, pi three k. Uh, so there is a um, there is this possibility that if, if you inhibit and torque and Rapamycin not capable of inhibiting, inhibiting it fully, you induce a, uh, uh, a feedback on PI3K, which will no longer be inhibited, and then it will overstimulate this pathway. Uh, the, the other reason for uh, rapamycin being uh, ineffective is that it does not inhibit and talk to which has its own way, uh, even if not so well understood, to uh, induce the activation of this pathway. And then we have to consider other uh, aspects as well. For instance, the, uh, the, 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 the so common isocitrate dehydrogenase uh, mutation. Why is it uh, important in the, in the uh, in the development of, uh, uh, of glioblastoma? Well, uh, uh, probably uh, because of the reason depicted here, uh, the uh, normal product of, uh, of uh, isocitrate dehydrogenase is alpha glutarate which goes on to uh, uh, sort of uh, activate the, uh, uh, these other pathways inside the cells, like the TAC2 DNA hydroxylase, which have to do with chromatin remodeling, and uh, this, which evidently is a, a needed uh, process within the cells, is inhibited if, if the, uh, the uh, uh, in case the IDH mutant is there, and, and, and it causes the production of a different product, the 2 hydroxyglutarate instead of alpha glutarate and again, the uh, uh, glioblastoma, glioblastoma multiforme is, uh, is a strongly glycolytic, uh, glycolytic uh, uh, cancer, uh, even though it has availability of oxygen, will uh, uh, rely heavily on, the, uh, on glycolysis, on the production of, uh, of lactic acid, uh, with so-called Varvor effect, and uh, uh, so it will be more difficult to, to uh, control its, uh, its growth, considering that it has this uh, alternative uh, way of finding its uh, energy uh, through uh, glycolysis. So coming to the end, uh, precision medicine, which was in the title uh, of the uh, of, of, the, uh, of the seminar. Um, 
I'm glad Walter came because he can <laughs> help somehow. I, it is not clear to me. Uh, the, the concept of precision medicine is not really clear to me. It's an emerging approach for disease treatment and prevention that takes into account individual variability uh, in genes, environment, and lifestyle for each person. I don't see why it should be considered really different uh, from the concept of personalized medicine. Uh, but it, it tells me something at the end, and, uh, uh, which I uh, bring in, in my last slide. The most often asked question is, what do we know about the biology and genetic of tumors? So that will lead us to treatment. I think that uh, it might be better uh, to ask a different question. What do we know about the biology and genetics of the resistance to tumors? Why is it that, fortunately, the majority of us does not have a tumor? Uh, because of our biology, because of our genetics, or maybe it will be possible to find those protecting genes that can be the ones to be fully exploited in a approach of personalized medicine. That's what I would like to offer to your uh, consideration. If there are any questions, I most unlikely be able to answer, but if <laughs> <laughs>